Let's enter our study in the Word today by inviting the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us, that we would be attentive to the leading of the Spirit on our lives. We just ask that we want more of His presence in our life. So let's pray for that as before we jump in and study the Word together. Would you join me? Lord, we want to do just what we just sang. Lord, we want to invite your presence into our lives. We know that you are here with us. Uh, we want to be attentive to your voice, the things that you would lead us in. And so, Lord, we just come before you this morning and we submit ourselves to you, more of you in our life, more of you, more of your presence in our life. Lord, I pray that you would just do a work by the, the teaching of your word, by the leading of your spirit. Lord, that you would guide us this morning. Lord, direct our hearts closer to you. Lord, I pray for anyone maybe who is visiting church, who's just checking it out, Lord, that you would speak to them this morning. Direct their hearts this morning. Lord, as well as those that maybe have been walking for so many years, Lord, would you grow and mature us in your word by the working of your spirit. Lord, do that work apart from anything that we would orchestrate this morning, that you would be so present with us, that, that we would leave here, Lord, praising your name for the thing that you did in us this morning. Less of me and so much more of you. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to dive right in this morning uh, about something that we talked about last week. Uh, one of the theme from last week uh, was this. Jesus is leaving, right? You remember this. Jesus is leaving, and his parting words, or some of his parting words to his disciples were, the world is going to what? Hate you. <laughs> Which is like, what? Right? Th that's what Jesus tells his disciples. He's like, fellas. I'm leaving. And we remember this. Our, their hearts were troubled. And then he says, and by the way, the world is going to hate you. <laughs> and specifically, he says there's reasons why they're going to hate you. And we talked about last week, it shouldn't be because you're a jerk, right? They shouldn't hate you for you being a jerk. That, they, they will hate you for that reason. But instead, he says, listen, they're going to hate you. Here's why. And we gave three reasons last week. He says, because you're going to look different than the world. He said last week, the world is going to hate you, Jeff, because I chose you out of the world and you look different than the world. The world's going to hate you for that. The other reason why, remember I brought out the Clippers jersey? And, and I said, listen, because you're going to bear the name of Jesus on your, li on your life. That when you leave this place, when you leave the house in the morning, you put on and bear the name of Jesus on your chest. And people don't like Jesus, right? There, there's going to be a world that hates you because of the name of Jesus. That's what Jesus tells to his disciples. He says there's another reason they're going to hate you. In the same way that I entered the world, I came from heaven to earth, and I walked amongst the world in, in the darkness, and I was the light in the darkness, you too will be a light in the darkness. And what does the world think about the light? I don't like the light, right? Keep that away from me. Keep your opinions to yourself. I, I get uncomfortable around the light. Stay away. And he says, listen, you're going to be that light in the darkness, and the world is going to hate you. To then, the question must have been for them, right? If you're a disciple, and you followed Jesus for three and a half years, and he is it, right? Jesus is the ministry. Jesus is, is everything to you. And you've given up lots to follow him. And he says, I'm leaving. What's your next question? What are we going to do? Where are, you gonna, where are you going, right? He, they did ask him that. And then the question is, well, what about us? Who continues on this ministry? I mean, you're the, you're the Michael Jordan of the Chicago Bulls, right? You're the Kobe Bryant of the Lakers, or the LeBron today, right? You're everything. We, we center our team around you, Jesus, and now you're leaving. What happens to us? Who's going to do the miracles? Where's the power of this ministry going to come from? Who's going to preach on Sunday, right? Who's going to teach when we go out? You were the one, Jesus. To which Jesus is going to answer that question for us this morning. He's going to say, I'm sending someone. I'm sending someone to come and be with you. you remember what his name is? It's not an it, by the way. Oftentimes we think, we say the Holy Spirit, it is, but it's a he is. It's the third person of the Trinity. It's the Holy Spirit that Jesus says, I'm going to send a help for, helper, a comforter to come and be with you. Turn with me to John chapter 15 in your Bibles this morning. John chapter 15. 
And I'm going to give you three words that are going to help kind of guide us through our time this morning. Three simple, simple words. And these are all the things that the Spirit comes to do according to Jesus. Here are those three words. And if you're a note taker, you're going to want to write them down. And there will be a test at the end of this morning. So it's a simple test. All you have to do is remember these three words. Here we go. The first word is testify. The Holy Spirit comes to testify about Jesus. The second word is magnify. He comes to magnify the works of Jesus. And the third, can you want to check your guess? Woo! Right? Right? Front row stew. Glorify, right? Glorify. The third word there is glorify. So write those down. We're going to take a test at the end. We'll see how you, see how you do on that test. Testify, magnify, glorify. They're all ifis. Right? Here we go. The first one he says, the Holy Spirit is coming and he's going to testify of me. Look at uh, John 15. You're right there. Verse 26. Verse 26. Here's what it says. When the advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will, help me out, testify about me. Right? He will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit comes to testify about Jesus. Now here's an incredible text. You're right there in 15. Jump back to 14, verse 17. John chapter 14, verse 17. Here's an incredible reality and truth. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to send to you. And Jesus says, I mean, he's going to be with you. But look what else he says in John 14, verse 17. The Spirit of truth, the one we just read about, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and what? Will be where? In you. I will not leave you as orphans. He's answering that question. Where are you going? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you in the presence of the Holy Spirit, which he says will not just be with you, but will take up residence in you, will abide in you. And what's he going to do? He's going to testify of who? Of Jesus. He's going to come in you and he's going to testify. Look at John 14, 25. You're right there in 17. Look at 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Jesus, again, talking to his disciples. But the Helper, again, another name, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. He's going to come and and be in you, and he's going to teach you and bring to remembrance the things I've taught you. What's he doing? He's testifying to Jesus. He's testifying about who Jesus is, and he's doing it inside each and every person that has put their faith and trust in Christ, that have believed on him. Now, there's a moment where Paul is writing this this, uh, letter to Corinth, and he says, listen, God has revealed something to us, to Paul and and to the, the apostles. He's revealed something about the mysteries of God, In fact, what he's talking about is that God is redeeming people to himself. He's drawing people into his family. And he talks about the Holy Spirit. Look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Here's what he says. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. In other words, we have a different sort of wisdom that we're talking about here. It's a different sort of wisdom than you get in school, right, or from your classes or from the world. We have a different sort of wisdom. What kind of wisdom? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. That's the gospel, that God is saving sinners to himself, welcoming them into his family, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord our, of glory. But... As it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, here's the question mark. 
If it has not, if this mystery, this gospel message did not enter their eyes or their ears or their heart, then how did they know about these things? Paul, how did you find out? How did you come to know and understand the gospel? Here's what he says. But God has revealed them to us through his what? Spirit, his testifying spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? You only know what's inside of you. Your spirit only knows what's inside of you. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world. Paul, what kind of spirit did you receive? But the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That's an incredible reality. Paul's saying the things that we have conveyed to you about the gospel, about God redeeming this dark sinner world to a relationship with him, we have received by the Spirit which knows God, the deep things of God. And he's saying, listen, catch this, this same Spirit comes and dwells in you and testifies about who Jesus is. Is that not incredible information? Is that not an incredible reality that the Spirit of God lives and dwells in each of you? But now listen, he's not only come into you to testify about Jesus to you, but he's going to use you then to testify to others about him. Look what he says here in 27. He says, and you also must testify, right? I'm not just coming to take up residence in you, Jeff, so that you have all this information about who Jesus is so that you would love Jesus more. I'm doing that. But I'm coming to you so that you also will testify. Look what he says in 27 and talking to his disciples. For you have been with me from the beginning. Your testimony, in other words, is so powerful. You know, you know what I've said, Jesus would have said to his disciples. You know what I've done. You've been with me. And I'm going to come and empower you to take that message of the gospel and all the teachings that we've done and all the, the miracles that I've done, and you're going to share about who I am to the world. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, listen, this is so important. The Spirit comes and dwells in you, and then you will go out to the ends of the world. Now, I want you to see this when this moment happens, because it's incredibly powerful. This moment when the Spirit comes and dwells with mankind. Jesus talks about it in Luke 24. Here's what he says. Thus is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. You know what that is? That's testifying. He said, this is what you're going to take out with you when you go to your workplaces, when you go to your families. You're going to proclaim this message. You're going to testify of this. Then he says, The forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father, where? Upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Who is he talking about there? Help me. Who is he? The Holy Spirit. He's saying, don't go out into anywhere else other than Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem until my Holy Spirit comes and empowers you to testify to the nations around you. Don't try to do this on your own. There's going to be a moment when my Holy Spirit will come upon you and then you will testify to the nations. Look what he says in Acts. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This moment is going to take place, and you will know <laughs> it's time. Get to testifying. There's a work that's going to be done in you, and then you're going to do work of testifying for me. Look what he says here in Acts 2. This is that moment, uh, this, this very famous moment in Scripture in Acts 2 where it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty 
rushing wind. And, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And this incredible moment, people began to hear the gospel in their own language. And, and people from all over the place who had gathered. And they're thinking, these people are weird, right? But they're speaking to me. There's something going on in my heart and in my soul. And the Spirit is testifying to who Jesus is. And he's using these disciples and these apostles who he had said, wait here, wait here. And now they're filled with the Spirit and they're testifying about him. Now, look what happens. And divided the tongues of fire, appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And people begin to give their lives. In fact, here's the incredible thing. In this moment, Peter stands up. You remember this from Acts, right? Peter stands up and he gives this testimony about who he is and who Jesus is and the work that Jesus had done and who he truly was. And do you remember how many people gave their lives to the Lord that day? 3,000 people. How incredible is that? 3,000 people, the spirit at moving, Peter, you remember Peter, right? I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know who, right? <laughs> Cowering away, denying Christ, right? And yet in this moment, filled the spirit, testifies about who Jesus is, 3,000 people give their lives to the Lord that day. Why? Because one of the roles and goals of the Holy Spirit is that I'm going to come inside of you and I'm going to testify about who Jesus is. I'm going to draw you to him. And then you, believer, are going to turn around and by my power testify about who Jesus is so much so that people will be drawn to him and they will give their lives to him. I hope you're one of those people that testify about who Jesus is because of what he's done inside of your life. And the Holy Spirit, that's what he's trying to do. He's saying, listen, I'm going to move you into a testifying time in your life. But listen what he says next. These, Jesus saying, talking to his disciples, these testifying times will also be trying times. Right? These testifying times will also be trying times. And we saw that last week. He said the world's going to hate you. Right? That it's not going to be easy to testify about me, that there are also going to be difficult times ahead as you testify. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Here's what it says. All this I have told you, Jesus talking to his disciples, so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asked me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I said, the, said this, these things. Listen to what he says here. He says, trying times, testifying times, are going to be trying times. The, the, these times when I've encouraged you to move out amongst the people, th you're going to be tested, right? They're, they're going to come against you. In fact, they're going to kick you out of church, synagogue, right? The hub of, of, of a town was the synagogue, the place of worship, the place where things took place where business was done, people talked and gathered around in the synagogue. It was the center of the culture. And he's saying, essentially, you're going to be kicked out of that culture. And we actually know that Jesus says your families are actually, many of your families are going to turn their backs on you. In fact, some of your families are going to turn you over to the authorities. That's how bad it's going to get. Can you imagine hearing that? And in fact, he says, he continues on, and he says, some of you are going to be killed for bearing my name, for wearing my name, for being the light in the darkness, for looking different than the world around you. Some of you are going to lose your lives. And they're going to say, we did it for God, right? We did it in the name of Yahweh. These people that follow Jesus, right? That's, that's heresy. That's blasphemy. We, if we kill them, then we look good to God, right? Which is so false, right? There's something misguided by that. 
But the reality of what he's saying is, listen, it's going to get hard. It's going to get extremely hard. But listen, I want you to keep testifying. Well, how are we going to do that? I'm sending you my Holy Spirit. He's going to live and dwell in you. He's going to give you wisdom and direction. I'm sending you my Holy Spirit to give you boldness. But Jesus, we're going to be scared. Yeah, I know. It's going to be a difficult time. You're living in the, in the darkness of the world. But I'm sending my spirit to come and be with you and what? In you. And I will just tell you, believer, that's to you this morning. You are venturing out on a daily basis into a world that has rejected God. And yet you go with the power of God because of what he has deposited in you. What he has abided in you is the Holy Spirit. And I would just say, and we sang it, Lord, we need to recognize that more in our lives. That as Jesus is saying, listen, I'm sending you out into the darkness, but I'm sending you with my, the power of my Holy Spirit. The same power that, that Peter had when he got up and preached and 3,000 gave his life, that same power. I'm sending you, Jeff, out with that same power. Fill in the blank. I'm sending you with that same power each and every day, dwelling in you. And the question is, how often do I, do we recognize that? That we have this deposit from the Lord living in us, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that says, I've come, Jeff, to dwell in you, to testify about Jesus, and to use you to testify about Jesus. But I'm scared. Yeah, I know. Don't you think the disciples were scared when Jesus says, they're going to kick you out of church. They're going to kick you out of synagogue. And some of, them, some of you are going to die. They're going to kill you. Oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? Believe and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Continue to walk out this life in the Spirit. No lone rangers. Listen to what he says here. I've told you this, right, in, in, in 16 verse 1. He says, I've told you this so you will not fall away. So that when these times come, and maybe you, we would just say, in some, to some degree, they're here now, right? People don't like to hear about the name of Jesus. There, there's a lot of judgment, right, of, of the church, some of it's okay. Some of it's probably right. And in other parts of it, it's because there's a world that says, I don't want to hear that. He's saying, listen, when these times come, I don't want you to be surprised. I, just, I don't want you to think something odd is happening. I'm telling you this, he says there in 16.1, I'm telling you this so you will not fall away. So that instead of your faith being weakened, your faith will be strengthened because I told you it was coming. When they come after you, I don't want you to think, oh, God has turned his back on us. That's why they're coming after us. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's not why. I, I want you to know that's going to happen. And instead of, of turning away from the Lord, you would turn to the Lord and say, God, I can only do this in your power. That, that when the, the persecution comes upon the church, the, the response of the church isn't to say, some strange thing is happening to us. No, it's the thing that Jesus talked about quite a bit. When that persecution comes, it says, I'm going to hold tighter on to the Lord. And in fact, listen, I'm going to testify all the more. All the more reason for me to share the gospel. All the more reason for me to be emboldened in my faith and strength. Because I know who lives inside of me. Look what he says then. How is it better? Look at verse 7. He shares this with him next. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good or to your advantage that I am going away. Unless, this is Jesus again talking to disciples, unless I go away, the advocate or helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you. Now, you just talked about persecution and suffering and pain and killing. And Jesus, how is it that be better that you leave? How is it better that you go? I mean, I would think, you know, just me, <laughs> if those things happen, we need to look to you to get help. You will have the answers in these situations. You're the one we always turn to for problems. And Jesus, you tell us somehow that it's better that you leave us than for you to stay with us. I don't understand. He says, yeah, it's better that I leave because when I leave, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to be with you. Now, think about that gift for a second. You could have 
the presence of the living Son of God, right, dwelling with you. In, I mean, he could be here with us, and we would all say, yeah, that would be awesome. I want to I be with Jesus, right? And we would all be right, of course. But how cool would that be to have him just right there? But he's saying, actually, what y'all have, what I have, what we have, is better than that. What he's saying to his disciples is it's better, it's to your advantage that I am not here and instead you have the third person of the Trinity dwelling with you. What could he possibly mean by that? Well, I think there's lots of advantages that he could mean. I think one of the most significant ones is Jesus comes from heaven to earth and he puts on, what's this? Skin. He puts on flesh, which then he can only be at one place at one time. So you could have Jesus at work with you tomorrow, but I get him the next day, right? He has to come with me to work the next day. Well, I want him at Thanksgiving. Okay, Jesus can come with you to Thanksgiving. But he can only be with one of us at a time. But when he says, listen, it's to your advantage that I leave, and I will send my spirit, which can be with all of us at all times. He can live and dwell in you at all times. So he comes and takes resident. He says, it's to your advantage that I go. That's an incredible gift, an incredible reality. In fact, we're going to see later on that the Spirit speaks for Jesus. That the Spirit speaks only what he hears. And in fact, you can go to your work and I can go to my work and we can go to different things giving meals together and Jesus can speak to our, the Spirit that lives within us and direct our hearts and minds to him. It's an incredible advantage, he says. I'm going to come and I'm going to send my Holy Spirit within you. My faith would have been stronger, some say, if I could just have seen the miracles. If I could just have walked with Jesus, then I would believe. And I'm just telling you, actually, there were many who did not believe. Right? We know that from our text. There were many who walked with Jesus, saw the miracles, heard the teachings, and did not believe, did not give their lives over to him. I say this. We live in a much better day, right? Where he says, it's to your advantage, I'm sending the Spirit. What do we have? We have the, the fullness of his scripture, his living and active word that we get to see throughout history written down, and many of you can read. So that's an advantage, right? And you have that Holy Spirit working with you through the text to guide and direct your life. This is an advantage, right? We have the working of the church, the Holy Spirit guiding and moving the church over the last 2,000 years. We have the history of the church to see and look back on and think, that's an advantage. I mean, these guys are at the, gro the, the ground level. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen? Right? Jesus says, I'm going to send my spirit, and God's going to do a work in you and through you. We have a great advantage. So the first one we talked about, first answer on the test at the end of this message, uh, the first answer is going to be what? Testify. The Holy Spirit comes and he testifies in us and through us. The second one he's going to do is he's going to magnify. He's going to magnify Jesus' work. What does a magnifying glass do? Right? Takes an image, and as you look at that image, it magnifies it. It makes it bigger. What it doesn't do is create a new image. Right? It, it's not going to make something out of nothing. It's actually just taking what is already there and making it bigger so we could see it, to give it more clarity and color, and, and, and to get, look at the details, right? I can use the magnifying glass for that. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit comes to do. Listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to do something new that, that Jesus didn't already lay the foundation for. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to invent new ways of, of worshiping. Doesn't try to, he's saying, listen, we're going to take Jesus... And I'm going to magnify him. I'm going to make him bigger. I'm going to make him more clear to you. Look what he says here in John chapter 16, verse 8. When he comes, again, that's the Holy Spirit, he will convict, or some of you have the translation, prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now 
stands condemned. Now, super important for us to understand, and we talked a little bit about it last week. We talked about the world. And the world is the system that is working against the living God, right? The system is made up of people and led by who? The enemy or Satan, right? That, that at the very beginning of creation, God creates everything. He sets it, sets it going in motion, right? Adam and Eve are there. It's perfect harmony between the Lord and each other, and it's great. And who comes in? The enemy, right? The devil comes in. And we, lo- we looked last week, and it says the devil is the father of lies. It's the very core of who he is. He lies and he deceives. And in that moment, he deceives Adam and Eve, and they fall. And now the darkness of that world comes in. That there are people who reject the living God, right? Reject and turn their backs against him. And, he, and Jesus is saying, that's when he talks about the world. He's, that's what he's talking about, is, is this idea that there's a group of people, the world, that have turned their backs on the living God. In fact, Jesus says, I'm that light that goes into that world, right? And people hate me for it, but I'm the light that go into the world to bring people and draw people back into understanding who God is, again, and the love he has for that world. So here in our context, when we talk about the world, the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, that their need is of righteousness, and that there is a coming judgment. What he's saying is Jesus came from heaven to earth to do that same thing, that as he walked about, he would convict the world of sin, that he lived out perfect righteousness, God's righteousness, and that he talked about a coming judgment for the world. And so here, the the Holy Spirit, according to John and according to Jesus, is that he's come in, in, in all ways just to magnify those works of Christ. And so let's take a look at those. Take a look with, at that first one. It says, listen, the Holy Spirit will come and convict the world of sin. John uh, 7, 7 says, The world hates me, Jesus, because I testify of its works being evil. The world hates me because I go into the world and I say that that's a sin. And the world hates me for it. I I, I remember this in my life. Do you remember this? The moment you came to the Lord, or maybe the moment leading up to the Lord, where there were things in your life that you just knew were not of God, right? And I, quite frankly, didn't need to know all of Scripture to know that to be true. I had not studied all the book of the Bible to know the things that were going on inside of my life were not representative of God. And that is the work of the Spirit. He's come to convict the world, which I was a part of for my life, and at one point you were as well, to convict the world of the sin that is in their lives. That's hugely important. There's got to be that moment in all of our lives where there's a recognition that the things I've done in my life or are doing in my life are apart from a perfect, sinless God. And he's saying, listen, that is the work that the, the, uh, the Spirit will come and magnify in them. In fact, I have to jump forward here a couple of passages. In that Acts passage that we read about, right? As that Acts passage that we were looking at, uh, Acts 2.36, listen, it says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made these, this, this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, this is the 3,000 people that Peter got up and preached to, and their souls came to know the Lord. He says, now when they heard this, they were what? Cut to the heart. When they heard this preaching that, that, that Peter had just preached, by the move of this, in the power of the Holy Spirit, it says that they were cut to the heart. And there was a moment in all of our lives where this happened to us. We heard the gospel, the good news of Christ, and we were cut to the heart. Where else could I go? What am I supposed to do? And, and listen, he says, And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What do we do? They're sitting with this guilt on their life because of the sin by the magnifying work of the Holy Spirit. And they say, what do we do? To which Peter says, what? Repent. In other words, turn away from those sins. Walk in the light, not in the darkness. He says, listen, be baptized. Get baptized. Identify with believers. Walk with believers. Identify yourself as a follower of Christ. 
get baptized. And the third thing he says, listen, and you shall receive, guess who? The Holy Spirit. In that same text, he says, repent, turn away from those sins, be baptized, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. He will come and take residence with you. He will dwell with you. So that first thing he says, listen, there's a sin problem. We all have it. And he says, listen, the Holy Spirit will magnify that. Here's the other thing he says, verse 10, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. The Holy Spirit is going to come and convict the world of their need for righteousness. So here's the question for you. Where do you fall on the scale of righteousness? Where's your, what, what number are you? It's kind of a trick question. If God is 10, that's like the holy, you know, the holiest of holies, perfect righteousness. You can't be in, you can't be in 10. Or one is like, well, maybe I, I should be in, in jail instead of at church this morning. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. That's on the other side of the spectrum. Where do I fit in the, the righteousness scale? Maybe some of you would say, well, I'm a nine because I'm, I'm pretty good, right? Here's the trick, right? No one fits on the, on the scale. No one can reach a 10, right? God is, is perfect righteousness. And, and, and we may come up with even say, oh, I'm a four. I'm just going to be humble. I'm a four. Or maybe I'm a two. The reality is no one is good enough. No one is righteous. In fact, that's in, in the text in Romans 3. Uh, Romans 3 says, there's no one who is righteous. No, not one. None of us are righteous enough. And so the Holy Spirit comes to magnify this truth that you would know there's no one who could be a 10. And 10 is what is required. Let me say that again. No one could reach the level of 10 being holy and righteous perfectly. And 10 is what is required to enter into heaven, to enter into the presence of a holy and righteous God. And and no one can reach that. Here's another scale sometimes we'll like to use at times. Is, is the weighing scale, right? And, and, and if we say, if we just do enough good works that overweigh or outweigh our bad works, then we'll be good people, right? That we'll be righteous in God's eyes. That, that if we just do enough good things, we, we donate money and we give of our time and we're just really nice people, the people at work, right? If we just do that, then God will see us as good, and he'll say, come on in, Jeff. You, you know, you messed up in some areas, but you're really overly, all just a really good person, right? And we know that's not true, right? And, and, and in fact, that's a, that's a dangerous scale to mess with, because, well, how much do I have to do? And, and, you know, maybe I can just downplay some of the bad things in my life and overplay some of the good things, and that looks better, but then I'm the judge of that, what, about, what does God say about me? And so the reality, we just want to get rid of both of those scales and just look to one scale, which is we look at Jesus, the perfect sinless son of God, which is what he's saying here. He's saying here, listen, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. What he's essentially saying is, I've come from the Father. Now I've come to walk amongst you, perfect and sinless. I am the scale by which you would judge yourself by not by the person sitting next to you, right? Because we know you're more holy than them, right? You're more righteous than them. Not by your coworkers or your friends. We don't judge by that scale. We say, okay, we're going to look at Jesus. He is the measuring stick. He is the scale we judge our lives to. And if that's the case, then each and every one of us falls short because none of us, no, not one, is righteous. No, not one is perfect. And that is the requirement. We have to be tens. We have to be ten on the scale. Look at this. So where do we get this righteousness from? Where do do we get to? The Holy Spirit says, listen, Jeff, you're a sinner. I know, I know, right? You've fallen short of the glory. I know. And you, Jeff, Jeff, you need to be righteous. Okay, but I don't see, how do I get there? How How do I become righteous? Look what he says in Romans 3.22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who what? Believe. Believe. And I can just tell you, the, the, the gospel writer of John, he would love this passage because all through John, we see this, this common theme, believe, believe, believe. I'm writing this gospel so that you will believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
right? And here in Romans, it's written, it says, this righteousness comes through faith in Christ to all who, put, who believe in him. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. Here's why. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to magnify this work. I'm going to magnify the sin. I'm going to magnify the righteousness. Here's why this is so important. Because if you take sin of humans and you take the righteousness of God and you put them together, there's a natural consequence of judgment. There's justice that needs to happen, right? So you take the sin of man, I'm going to magnify that, the Holy Spirit says, and you take the righteousness of God, there is a judgment that comes. This is Jesus' message, right? I'm going to walk around, I'm going to tell people about sin, and I'm going to tell about and live out righteousness because Jesus says, and the Holy Spirit confirms, magnifies, there is a judgment that will come. Look what he says here in verse 11. And he's going to come and convict the world about judgment. Because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Who's the prince of the world? We just talked about it, right? There's this darkness turned its back on God, being led by an enemy of God, which is Satan. And he says, he's already been condemned. That through the death on the cross and the resurrection, death has been defeated and the enemy has been defeated. In fact, you could go all the way to Revelation and look at that text about the lake of fire and the enemy already prophesied about being cast into that lake of fire. The enemy has been defeated. And he's saying that's what happens when sin and the perfect righteousness of God come together. There's a judgment, but look it. The enemy has already been defeated. And now what's he saying? He's saying to the people, I don't want you to be defeated. I don't want you to go the way of the world. I don't want you to go the way of the enemy. So I'm sending my spirit so that you, Jeff, will know what sin is. You will know that you do not measure up to the perfect righteousness of God. And so that you will be saved from eternal judgment. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And even still this morning, I would say, maybe he's doing in you right now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, yeah, I am, a, I am a sinner, right? Welcome, welcome, everyone, welcome, right? I am a sinner. I have fallen short of that glory. And I don't measure up to God's righteousness, his perfect righteousness. And I don't want to face that judgment, which he says the enemy has already faced. So what do I do? Well, I put my faith and trust in the living God. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit working in you and through you, testifying and magnifying Christ. Super important that we see this. That Jesus doesn't come into the world to condemn it. Let's say that very carefully. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it. We know why he came. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Which world was that again? Oh, that was the world that had turned its back on him. And even to this day is turning its back on him. That world, okay, that world, okay. He didn't didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to what? Save the world. Why? Because for God so loved the world. That God says, listen, I'm sending my spirit now to come and speak through you, Jeff, through you, refugee, By the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to testify about me and this mission that we're on. And you're going to magnify that the world is in sin. I am a righteous God and there will be a judgment. But listen, I'm doing that because I love you. In the same way a parent would say, listen, son, this action that you've done is is not in line with our family values. And and we need to correct this. And it hurts me to do it, but I'm going to punish you. I'm going to draw you in through punishment and through love and through grace and through mercy. And and I'm going to correct this action. Why? Because I don't want you to keep walking in it. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He says, Jeff, I don't want you to keep walking in that sin. So I'm going to convict you of it. And I'm going to to demonstrate to you that this is not the way of God. And and, and, and why? Because I want to see change. I want to see you grow out of this. And I would say the same thing for us this morning. And so the first thing he says is the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to what? Oh, let's try that again. Hey, he's going to do what? And then he's going to do what? And then he's going to do what? 
And then he's going to glorify. So let's close with the glorify, glorify and look at verse 12. Here's what he says. I have much more to say to you, talking to his disciples. And remember, they're troubled, their hearts are heavy, they're burdened. He, he says, more than, it's more than you can bear. It's more than you can now bear. He, li- he says the sensitivity to his, to his followers and his, his people. He says, I have so much more to share with you, but, but, but it's more than you can bear right now. Look at verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, we've been talking about him this morning, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. Look at verse 14. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. Jesus putting himself on the same pedestal as the Father, right? Father and Son, they are one together. He was undenying in that. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Listen, the Holy Spirit comes to glorify Christ, to make much of the name of Jesus. He says, so much so that the things that you receive from the Spirit living inside of you are coming directly from me. Take that in for a second because that's pretty powerful. That when I hear the Holy Spirit speak, that's Jesus, that's the Lord speaking to me. At face value, when I don't listen to the Holy Spirit, that's not me listening to the, whole, the Holy Savior, right? The Son of God. So how valuable is it that we listen to the Spirit? That we're attentive to Him? What He's saying is that when that Holy Spirit speaks, He is speaking for me. He is making much of me. His words are my words. He's magnifying and testifying of me. Listen, this is so important. When those 3,000 people get saved that day back at Pentecost in Acts, and now the disciples, they got these 3,000 people sitting, listening, watching, waiting. What do we do now, right? Who's going to lead this? Do you think any of them said, man, I wish Jesus was here, right? We could have just turned to him. And then one of them probably said, but wait a minute. Remember what he said. He said that that Holy Spirit is going to come and live and dwell in us. He will purpose to to give us only what Jesus gives them. He is here. He is guiding the church. He's moving it forward. How are we going to remember what he teaches, what he taught us, so that people could, we could write it down? How are we going to remember those things? The Holy Spirit will be with you. How, how, what are we going to do when those hard, challenging questions come up, which they inevitably will, those gray areas? How are we going to answer those things? We'll go to the Word. We'll, we'll be led by the Holy Spirit. He will move the church forward, all glorifying Jesus, all lifting up the name of Jesus. When religions, or maybe uh, pseudo-Christian religions, or, or false Christian faith, or, 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 or cults of Christianity, some would call it, devalue the name of Jesus, we know that is not of the Spirit, right? When they say, well, he never really said that. I don't believe he said that. Anything that we see where he's somehow devalued, he's not lifted up as Lord and Savior and God, we know that is not a working of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the work of the Holy Spirit elevates the name of Jesus. Can you get the name of Jesus too high? I don't think so, right? Right? The perfect sinless son of God who died on a cross, who redeems us, who brings us from darkness into light. I don't think you can go too high with that name. And so any place where we see the name of Jesus devalued, we can know that is not of God. Because the role of the Holy Spirit, who lives and dwells in every believer, is to elevate the name of Jesus. And guess what? We've come to our testing time this morning. So, the Holy Spirit comes to do what first? Testify. Then what? magnify, then what? Glorify. Glorify. So guess what? If that Holy Spirit is living inside of us, if he is living inside of us, what should we do? Here comes the second part of the test. We should testify, magnify the name of Jesus, and glorify the name of Jesus. Are you ready to do that this week? Let's be people who purpose to say, listen, I'm walking out as a, a reflection of the light into the darkness, One of the responsibilities that I have as a follower of Jesus is I am going to testify about him 
I'm going to magnify his work, and I'm going to glorify his name. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. God, you are good. You are gracious. The fact that you even uh, have, have this message available to us is an incredible work of your, your hand of grace and mercy. Lord, I believe absolutely this morning, uh, Lord, as we're sitting here and listening, there are some that, you, that would say, I need that. There's something out of step with my life. I'm, I've, I've gone out of bounds in certain areas of my life. Maybe someone who, who once walked with you and now finds themselves walking apart from you. But I, I believe you would draw them into your relationship again because you love them. That's why you sent Jesus to die on a cross for us because you're redeeming the world. You're calling it out of darkness and into light. And this morning, I believe absolutely that the work of your spirit is here amongst us. Lord, I believe absolutely that the, the, the power of your Holy Spirit is here. Yes, that same power that we see in Acts, the same power that, that, that was moving amongst the 3,000. Lord, that same power of the Spirit is here in this place. Lord, I pray no one would walk away from the voice that they hear, speaking to them, directing them to follow you. The single greatest decision they will ever make on the face of this earth is to be in relationship with the Creator, the living God. God, would you do a work in this place? Would you do a work in refuge this weekend? Draw people to you. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.